this is a first in all the years of me doing Bible study. I'll be right back. We finished chapter 12, chapter 11 last week, and I thought we still had half to go. And so no one has sheets, including no one in here. So. <laughs> but, uh, well, I don't, I've got them. You just don't have them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Glory. How many are glad to be in the house of God tonight? Amen. Deaconess, would you come up and give a quick offering teaching and uh take the offering? Amen. Well, good evening. continue on just from what my weekly uh, tithe, uh, tithe, tithe offering teachings have been. And, you know, we're talking about how, you know, um, God rebukes the devourer. God fights for you when you line yourself up with the word. And so I'm just, we're going to go to a verse we all know, which is Malachi chapter 3. And uh, and um, what, and start in chapter 9. Now, how many of you know, we've, I've pointed out many, many a times where in the Old Testament and the New Testament where we are commanded to bring in our tithes, right? And remember I talked last week about, um, about how, um, lost my whole train of thought there, about how, um, you know, God doesn't need our money, but he wants our obedience, he, you know, he, he, he wants our obedience. He wants us to obey him and trust him and rely on him. And in Malachi chapter 3, verse 9, it says, You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me. And, you know, that's not a good place, place to be. You know, you're cursed and you're robbing God. Not a good place to be at all. So, you know, uh, and so then in chapter, or verse 10, it says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing until there is no more. And then, so if that's not enough, in, in verse 11, it says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not de destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. So, when you line yourself up with the word, when you pay your tithes and your offerings, because it's both of them, right? It's not just tithes, it's tithes and offerings. You know, that Later on in that verse, it says, God will rebuke the devourer for your sake. So when you line yourself up with the word, you've done all you can do, you stand and God will do his part. And so I know a lot of us are standing and we're, we're standing and we're like, God, we're standing. But just hold, hold the line, hold it, because in due season you will reap. And so I just want to encourage you with that. You know, in, in due season you will reap, and God will rebuke the devourer. Like Pastor Frank has pointed out many, many a times, it never says the devourer won't come. He just promises when he comes, he will rebuke him for your sake. So I just want to encourage you, keep holding the line. Keep standing in faith. Keep quoting the word. 
and and just keep standing because in due season we will read. So, so I just want to encourage you with that. So, so let's pray. Father God, Lord, we just thank you for tonight. God, Lord, Lord, we just we thank you for the opportunity to come together and to study your word. And and Lord, we just lift the offering up to you, God, Lord, and Lord, we just pray that you will bless it. You will multiply it 30, 60, 100 fold. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, they are printing their sheets. For the record, Brother Mike, can you hold up all those papers right there? I didn't drop the ball. I just printed the wrong sheets. So it's not that I didn't have it prepared. I just had the wrong stuff prepared for you this evening. I was forgot that I pushed through. But if you have your Bible this evening or up on the screen, if you'll turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter, Chapter 5, verse 7. 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 7. Everybody there say amen. Amen. So, it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now, how many people, don't raise your hand, expecting just to take it from you? Anybody? How many think, well, Lord, you know that I'm struggling. Why don't you do something? Whenever he was on the cross, last thing he said is, it is finished. Means he didn't have to do any more. Everything that needed done was finished on the cross. He said he left captiv captivity captive, gave gifts unto men, Matthew 28, Mark 16. Amen. And he said, you say unto your mountain, Mark uh, chapter uh, 11 verses 22 through 24. He didn't say call for Pastor Brian, right? right? But how many times when you, the Bible says, do not grow weary in well doing, he didn't say, oh, you hypocrite, you weak, nimble Christian. Come on. He said, do not grow weary in well doing. He's talking to the believers, people that's been standing to faith, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you, he, would he tell you, would he encourage, not just tell you, would he encourage you not to do something? If it was not not only possible but probable, and for a fact that that was going to happen, but whenever you start growing weary, you you forget something. Anybody ever got tired and made, and made dumb decisions? How about anybody traveling on the interstate got super tired and missed an exit? Yeah. Do you know? I'm here to tell you. Sometimes you might actually miss your exit exit with the Lord, but not because you were intentional but because you were tired and your enemy was roaming around like a roaring lion, but the Bible says that he's an imp when we see him. So as I taught in our overcomers class, just think about a, a lion that's had all his teeth pulled out. Okay? So he's just a gummy lion. He can roar, but he ain't got no bite unless you allow him. And that means you have to open the door up. Come on. So Corinthians 5, 17 says, you're a new creature in Christ. Well, of all things have passed, we'll build all things have become new. If you're still wrestling with the old, it's because you're feeding the old. Okay? So, but what about this casting all your cares upon him? Then you have a choice in it, right? Mm -hmm. And tonight, I, I, I'm going to share more on this, but sometimes, uh, periodic, per, per, periodically throughout my ministry, uh, there's not a lot of people here tonight, but you made it here, right? Uh, now, the Bible talks about prophetic acts. How I many know when he said he told them to speak to the dry bones? How I many know he didn't need them to speak? He right. needed their obedience and faith. Right. He said, speak to these dry bones to live. But then he told, then they come back together. He said, now you got to prophesy life to them, right? Right. He said, lay hands on your, come on. He said, lay hands on your belly, encourage yourself in the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. These are all scriptures. Mm -hmm. right. So to cast yourself, so 
You, 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 ever, you ever just started doing something about faith that felt silly? But have you ever not felt better when you acted upon the word? Mm -hmm. Now, do you need to physically do something for this to work? Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. But sometimes to engage your faith, you've got to, you've got to start moving the momentum. So here we have casting all your care. It says, and, and I want to read you some different translations here. Laying all your anxieties upon him, for he makes you his care. Then it says, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Putting all your troubles on him, for he takes care of you. Having cast all your anxiety upon him because him there is care about you. Tell God about all the things that make you sad or afraid or angry. Give your thoughts about those things to him and let, let them remain with him. Do this because you matter to him. Anybody starting to get the idea? We live in a world where if you were in a pressure cooker, you'd be overdone. <laughs> but the word of God doesn't return void. Amen. So let's read verse six for a moment. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now there's that season word again. <laughs> I don't know about you, but we've, we've got used to a microwave society. We, we expect it now, I, and we like it now. I don't know, I like it now. You know, I don't want to have to wait for this due season. But it's seed time harvest, right? I mean, you know, sometimes during the wait, you, you, it knocks off some of those prideful things that maybe could have been a doorway. Are you still with me? says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober. This is that verse I quoted to you all ago. Be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary, the, the devil, as a roaring like that. I want you to look at as. If you if you got a paper Bible, some highlight. It says as. It didn't say he is. Right. As. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. How can he devour them? Because he gets them to cast away their confidence. Okay? So today, tonight, or however, I could read a whole bunch more, but uh, you ever had to shake anything off? Anybody ever really bugged you and you had to give it to God to shake anything off? You had to shake some stuff off. You know, you have to do that in the, in the spirit realm and in the physical realm. So sometimes, uh, if you're not careful, the Bible says, think on these things, right? When these are lovely, when these are pure, when you're just, or being virtue, to be any praise, think on these things, Philippians 4, 8, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know your brain don't just go there on its own? Right. You know, your brain don't just wake up and go, it's a Philippians 4, 8 day. <laughs> Come on. How many have found it easier to think about the negative things than the positive things? <laughs> But to cast it, how, and if you're honest, there's things that bring you anxiety, fear, stress, doubt, all those things. Now look, did God say, oh, you weak knee Christian? He said, listen, when you have those things, notice he didn't say if. When you have them, cast them on me. My yoke is burden. My yoke is burden. <laughs> my, my burden is life. My yoke is easy. Come on. And you know what? That's Whenever I start feeling that way, I realize I've got the wrong yoke on me. And you know what? The fastest way a horse can get rid of a yoke is shaking that thing off. You ever seen one that decides it won't be broke? It don't sit still. It moves until it gets free. But when the right yoke is on it, you can take them wherever they want. Come on. And so today, today I just want to encourage you. I was going to have you do something, but if some of you felt led to do something, that's great. But uh, I want to encourage you tonight to just lay stuff at God's feet tonight. Just cast your cares upon him for he cares. You know, the Bible says he's not, he's not a God that doesn't know how you feel. He, he's had everything that you've ever went through, and he's went through it. Every temptation known to man, he's done 
Every one. So just lay it at his feet. And if you feel like shaking something off, shake it off. Let it go. Let the peace of God that rule your heart and mind that passes all understanding. You know how you can tell you when you get free? Because you get peace. If you don't have no peace, then you're not free. You need to get rid of some stuff. Well, it's still there. Well, it's probably still going to be there. But you know what? The Bible says you ain't changed one hair on your head by worrying about it either. You didn't overcome one thing by stressing out over it. All you did was give way to the enemy to steal your joy. <laughs> so you might as well just go ahead and start operating in faith. God is who he says he is. He can do what he said he can do. Amen. Yeah. Deacon, she may need help collating them. Uh, and if they're not printing or something, somebody let me know. Hopefully we're not waiting too much longer. Just so uh that was what I had for you tonight. We're going to look at a couple other things here real fast. That word. Care means anxiety. Care is for you. And, and casting means to throw upon or place them upon someone else. That's really deep, ain't it? Aren't you glad that words can just mean what they're supposed to mean? Mm -hmm. You were never designed to carry the weights of the world, but your Savior was. Amen. And when you try to do that, has anybody here ever, I, I don't know who this is for tonight, it's for someone, we're talking about words and knowledge and anyways. Anybody here ever tried to fix somebody? Mm -hmm. Anybody ever tried to step in and be somebody else's Savior? You know, they become your project. I'm, I'm, I hate to break it to you, but projects aren't from God. There's only one Savior, and His name's Jesus. That doesn't mean you can't disciple someone. Well, you disciple them by showing them the way that God fixed you. Right. Not how you can fix them. Amen. Big smile. Come on. And so, anyways, that was free tonight. All right. Glory. They should just about be done. You've got the first part so we can start on your sheets from last week if you still have them. Glory to God. They're rocking downstairs. <laughs> All right, chapter 12, the gift of the word of knowledge. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. And we are focusing in on the word of knowledge, amen, as given by the Holy Ghost. Is that all you guys had on your sheets? Yes. All right. Well, then you'll have to listen real close as we go ahead and go on. To another... The working of miracles. This is all scripture we've already covered. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another diverse kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. And we've, we've covered in depth already the difference between uh, your prayer language and, uh, and the prophetic in the body. And the difference of the, of the all that. Okay. We, how many remember all that deep teaching? And go look at it. I'm not going to reteach it tonight. But all these worketh that the one and self same spirit divide every man severally as he will. And notice it said severally. And who is the one that gets to decide? The Holy Spirit. The Bible says seek earnestly the best gifts, but it didn't say decide what gifts you are going to flow in. And we see that rampantly today. I'm a prophet. I'm an apostle. I flow in this gift. I flow in that gift. Well, I want to flow in this gift because it's super powerful. Blah, 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 blah. You don't get to choose. You don't get a choice. The only choice you have is being obedient and let the Spirit of God flow through you and keeping your, keeping your channel open and cleaned out so that the Holy Spirit can use you. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Look at that. We're coming. All right. 
Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 11. It's on your first sheet there. The epistle of 1 Corinthians is not a letter written to just one person. It is a letter written to the entire church of Corinth, as well as to the church, the body of Christ. In our day, some folks have thought these verses apply to an individual person, but Paul was telling the entire church to covet or desire spiritual gifts. How many know that God wants... Uh, the whole church, the whole body of Christ for the Spirit of God to be full today. Amen. He, you know, how powerful would the church be upon the earth if we were using the gifts that God has given us in these last days? For His glory, not ours. Amen? The Holy Spirit will divide the gifts of the Spirit to every man severally as He wills. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. As the Spirit wills. Per, Paul infers here that not every man is going to have all the gifts operating through him. But he said, For to one, not to everyone, is given by the Spirit, Spirit of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge. 1 Corinthians 12. 8. Now let me, before we get in here, we're, we're, we haven't got down here where we're different between the offices and the gifts specifically yet, but we're getting there. But uh, just because God uses you in a gift doesn't mean that is your just because God uses you to operate in a gifting doesn't mean that's your gift. Okay? And uh, and he's used me in almost all of them, but I know the ones that he's operated in. And, and, and you, you can have several more than one, and sometimes during your life you'll have ones that are more prominent than others. As Because who's deciding? The Holy Spirit. As, he, as he's following what has got the unction of the Holy Spirit and what he needs in the body of Christ, what he needs you. And you know what? Uh, the gifts and callings are without repentance, right? That's one reason why he tests people so much before he starts pulling them in. But you know what? The anointing is the gas that operates the gifts. And anointing operates out of holiness, keeping your spirit man filled up. That's free. I'll dig into more of that later on. That's why people get into a mess with the wrong spirit sometimes. Oh, we're not going to go over there tonight. Y'all, everybody find where I'm at now? All right. Lacking understanding, many people try to operate a gift of the Spirit themselves. I guess I'm supposed to go there. Without the unction of the Spirit of God. Anybody met somebody that tries to do it in their own strength or their own and get it hooked up with familiar spirits or other stuff? The sad part, some people don't even know that they got hooked up with the wrong stuff. That's what gives some of the spirit-filled folks a, a bad name. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a gift of the spirit is manifest in their lives on occasion. They think, now I possess the gift that I can operate it at will. Now, let me tell you what God offered. I'm just going to be honest. Everybody here knows that God operates uh, very heavily through me the gift of prophecy. But guess what? I don't walk up to someone and decide I'm going to prophesy to them. And as many as I've told many of you, I don't. if I don't have a word for you, I'm not going to make one up. And if God doesn't give me something, I ain't got nothing. Because I'm his vessel. I don't, I don't control the gift. The gift controls me. If you'll remember that, you'll be fine. It's, I know it sounds easy, but it's deep when you go. I don't control the gift. The gift controls me. And so many people have gotten that backwards today. I'll say it again. It's worth repeating. We don't control the gift. The gift controls us. Do you have something to say? Yeah, if uh, you say your Bible is to be given a word from the Lord for someone else, if I am to come to you to let you know what that word is, I'm going to agree with that person. Okay. Yeah, correct, correct. And we're going to get into all that to the way the official ways that the Lord wants us to operate and do things. How many guys, how many know the Bible says do things decently and in a word? And that's another reason why people have turned off the Spirit of God because order has been thrown. I mean, God's not the author of confusion. Right. And when you have chaos and things, we know who's at work. Mm -hmm. And it's sad because, you see, the enemy, he knows how powerful these Holy Ghost gifts are. So he wants to discredit. He don't even care if he can get somebody, get, if they think they're doing this or doing that or working or whatever all this stuff is. When you start operating that way, all it does is tarnish and hinders the move of God that God wants to move. 
And now listen, on the other hand, I've seen ogres that said you can't do this and they have such control on it. How many know God's not a controlling for God? Right. So those people that he has in authority, they should be gentle. It's the ones that are doing it. Are you all with me? That's free. So, but, and, but for now, we're a, you don't control the gift. The gift controls you. And if you'll stick with that simple thing through all the giftings of the Holy Spirit, you always you always uh, side on the right side. And now listen up, uh, uh, people are fickle. And when I first, not when I first got started falling heavily prophetic, but there was a season in my life I was falling heavily in prophetic. And even at the other churches, people would find out about the gifting and how that really God used for me. And they would show up and want to put a demand upon the gift. Well, there's, and you guys can do that. You can put a demand upon the gift, but uh, I can't let your demand move me to doing something that's uh, outside the will of God. Just because you want something doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's going to give it to you or he's going to use me to do it. But there is, I can also tell when people are tapping into the gift and are drawing out of the anointing out of me. Two separate things. Where do you with me? Before I started to say, people got frustrated because they'd show up and I wouldn't give them a prophetic word. Well, you know, I'm not a magic eight ball. I'm a God. I, I'm a man of God with the gifts of God flowing through me. And I work, in, I, I'm at his discretion because they're not my gifts, they're his gifts. Y'all understand? I know, isn't that so simple? How do we get it so messed up, right? So, However, if people try to do that, they will invariably get into trouble because they will be opening themselves up to satanic deception and to a wrong spirit. Now, I've taught on this already through this class many times. Anybody familiar with it? And I've taught in depth and gave you the scripture. Anybody familiar with familiar spirits? There's, the enemy has power. But if you're a right believer, you don't have to worry about any of that, right? We just talked about the beginning of this class. But what happens to people who don't keep their heart right and still try to flow in these things? And they're not pure. They open themselves up to familiar spirits. Well, guess what? A spirit can't tell the future, but they can sure tell everything you did today because of what they've been doing. They were familiar with you. They've had a demonic assignment following you around. So they'll tell people things that they think they know, that things that they know, and then they'll take that as confirmation that this person is flowing with that. Well, how do, you, how do you know if there is or not? Well, you go back to the Bible and say, you shall know them by their fruit. People's lives should be in order. Their countenance and how they respond to things should line up with the word of God. And they should make you want to be more holy. If you're around them and they're flowing with the gifts of God through the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about goody two shans or do goody two shoes or or trying to uh, or conviction and all those things. I'm just saying being around them should make you want to come up because it's the Spirit of the Holy Ghost flowing through them. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? I'm, I got a bunch of scripture on this for time's sake. We're going to get there, but so people do flow in the wrong stuff, and and so what happens is like a. I have a lot of good friends that are, that are Baptists and they talk about spirit filled now, praise God. But do you know what? Baptist folk know how to study their Bible. They know how to study to show themselves to prove. And they've seen a bunch of people that, that they wanted to believe in some of the stuff, but they kept seeing people uh, miss the mark or false prophecies or they weren't living the word of God. They'd get in church and feel good and then they'd go uh, not really live it. And uh, so uh, how they all got filled is they just want to see people live in the word like they know they're supposed to. Look, they're, they're doing that without the help of the Holy Spirit. They've got the Spirit of Christ that is helping them, but they don't have the infilling. So how much more should we not be better than them? Because that's what they always hear. Well, you guys are saying you're better than me, and I, you're not even following your word that way. Well, no, you should be showing them the Spirit of God help you. They encourage you. Not that you're better than them. They just make it easier for you. Do you see the difference? So, remember the Holy Spirit operates in line with the Word of God. So what does the Holy Spirit operate in? The Word, the Word of God. So anything the Holy Spirit flows through somebody should flow through the Word. Should line up with the Word. You know, it didn't say go bark like a dog three times and shake your head around. <laughs> What's that? Or kiss. 
Snakes? Yeah, no, we're not a snake handler church. He said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I'm, you know. Now, I have been, I, I don't like snakes, and I have been poisoned a snake bit two different times on the way to services and shook it off, and the Lord healed me and restored me. But, uh, you know, there was, certain, there was a time in my life that you had to chase me, or you could chase me around the world with a gardener snake, but you had to put it down sooner or later. We have to come to Jesus, Mom. <laughs> Now they don't bother me so much. It's, but I'm not going to go look for them, that's for sure. They don't bother me. But, so, when you get when you get away, so the, the, Holy, the gifts of the Holy Spirit operate as the Holy Spirit wills, not as we, we will. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. I already read that one. And when you get away from the Word, then Satan can accommodate you, even with supernatural manifestations. Remember, the Holy Spirit operates in line with the word of God. The word says his gifts operate as he will. So I don't like giving the devil any due. He's a defeated chump. He's lost and we're not going to talk about him much. But I do want, don't want to gloss over this because you might say I need some word for that. I remember when Moses went to get the children of Israel to set them free. And he was doing different things as the spirit led with his staff and different things. And what did the Pharaoh do? He went and got his, 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 his mystics that were filled with demonic things and they were able to do almost everything that God was doing by the Spirit. Now, the Spirit of God whipped them. I mean, they had snakes, and his snake ate them. <laughs> you know? But it wasn't that there wasn't things there. And people uh, sometimes discredit that so much as day and time. For now, uh, witchcraft and every other kind of demonic sorcery is on every TV station, every show you watch. And what, it's, what has happened is desensitized people that that stuff is actually real. Now, I'm not saying the stuff on TV you're seeing is real, but they've got you so desensitized you wouldn't even know if it was sitting right next to you. Do you see what I mean? And so, we want to make sure that we're operating in line with the Word of God, flowing in the Word of God, that people are operating around us, that they're operating in line with the Word of God. That is the brass tacks, okay? The word, the, and the word says his gifts operate as he wills. Who wills? The Holy Spirit. If an entire local body of believers will cover the gifts of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will divide to every man severally as he wills. Not as I will, not as you will, but as the Spirit wills. The word of knowledge manifested in different ways. I believe God wants to have stuff for the whole body. He was, he's ready to pour out. He's been ready forever. So why hasn't it happened? Because he's still looking for people to get themselves ready to be able to receive those gifts. Well, that's hard. No, it's not hard. It just means that you, you you surrender your life to him. He's your Lord, and you're willing to lay it all down and whatever it takes for him to flow through and use you. Now, to get your prayer language ain't that hard. It's simply, he says, give to any man that has liberal. Don't let me confer, confuse you about the free gift of the whole, being filled with the Holy Spirit, the free gift of speaking in tongues when I'm talking about the other gifts that he gives out as he says. But the gift of speaking in tongues and prayer language, it says he gives to every man to ask liberally. All you have to do is ask for that. Okay? The gifts of the Spirit aren't just manifest in a public assembly, however. As I mentioned previously, the word of knowledge will sometimes manifest through a vision, through a dream, through a message from an angel, or through the gift of prophecy. Mm -hmm. The Lord talks to me through all those things. And I say, how do you know? You've been doing this for that? No, I don't have any clue of really even what all pertains to. I'm just telling you what the Lord told me. Yeah. You know, that's how I know. Why? Because he loves you and he's got good things for you. The word of knowledge can also be manifest through the interpretation of tongues. How many have seen, you've seen it here. There's been a message of tongues came forth and then there's an interpretation that comes after. And there's two different sounds between that and your prayer language. And we've studied that in depth. Everybody remember? Okay, got one. However, the interpretation of tongues is usually not the vehicle through which the word of knowledge manifests in public assemblies, except perhaps through the ministry gift of diversities of tongues. First Corinthians 12 claims we've studied that. I'm moving on fast. The reason for that is the ministry gift of diversity of tongues is more closely related to the office of the prophet. The prophet's ministry were more, more consistently manifest the revelation gifts. Revelation gifts is showing something that he wouldn't have known without God showing it. Interpretation of the local body is usually filled with simple prophecy for edification, exhortion, and comfort. I remember studying those things. I'm going fast. 
and contains no revelation in it. So if it edifies you, exhorts you, and comforts you, that's what we're talking about here. The word of knowledge in the Old Testament. There were supernatural manifestations of the word of knowledge in the Old Testament, well as the New Testament. In fact, all the gifts of spirit were in operation in the Old Testament except tongues and interpretation of tongues. We will cover the reasons why these two gifts are not included. We study them in a later chapter. All right. So, but how many know the Bible's true? Yeah. Amen. How many know we're seeing here where these things are in operation? We're going to start the old, work our way to the new. Amen. That way you can believe that they're for you today, too. We do find all the other gifts of the Spirit, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, special faith, gifts of healings, workers of miracles, prophecy, and discerning spirits manifested in the Old Testament. These gifts of the Spirit were manifested in the New Testament, first in the ministry of Jesus after the Pentecost. The gifts of the Spirit were tongues, interpretation of tongues as well began to be manifested through the Spirit-filled believers. Let's look at the gift of knowledge and how it was manifested in the Old Testament. The word of knowledge to Samuel regarding Saul's donkeys. We find the Old Testament how the gift of the word of knowledge was used to help recover a lost property. When Saul was out looking for his father's donkeys that had either strayed or so, and someone said, why don't you go ask Samuel? You would know, he would know where they are. You know, the Bible says, uh, believe your prophets and prosper. Do you know what really happens anymore? Even when they know men are, of God are accurate, they don't want to believe it because they want to do things how they want, when they want, and where they want. And that crushes and hinders the moving of the prophetic voice of God even more. I mean, we just said the Holy Ghost is a gentleman, right? So people don't really really want to hear. Like this one, they said, well, why didn't you go ask the man of God? He'd have told you where it was at. Well, I don't want to go ask the man of God. <laughs> Come on. By the way, if the, if the Lord's at it, tell, dealing with you to go ask the man of God, he's already told the man of God. The man of God is waiting on you to be obedient. 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 9, verses 3, 5, 6, 15, 16, 19, and 20. And the asses of Kishal's father were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, take, son, take now one of the servants with thee and arise and go seek the asses. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to a servant that was with him, Come and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. And he said to him, Behold, now there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith come surely to pass. Neither now let us go hither. Now, listen, I know I've, I've been talking really plain. There's been so many false prophets in the last 20 years, especially the last 10 years. Do you know what people really found when they, when they find a prophet that's true? A man of God that's accurate, that's not just popping off every time he feels like it out of his flesh. Guess what? They trust to go ask the man. They know who they are. But notice they didn't say there was one in every city. God wants one that operating in every body. But, but uh, you need to know the, the real deal, to put it point blank. <laughs> Now let us go thither for preventure he can show us our way that we should go. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Remember what I said? Some of you looked at me funny. That I said, just go ask him. He already knows it. If the Lord's dealing with you to go, the man of God already knows. He, remember whenever Ananias went and laid hands on Saul, he told both of them? Listen, the Holy Spirit, he don't just show up. You don't just show up and go, oh yeah, I don't know why you're here. If they do, then maybe you didn't hear God to go there. But anyways, that's something else. Or maybe they're not the ones. Could be a lot of things. But God deals with both. And a lot of times, God won't let that man of God say anything until you come and ask. Y'all still here? Did y'all see that in the Word? Okay. Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin. This is what God was saying to Saul. Lord, we got told Samuel about Saul. And thou shalt anoint him to be captain over the people of Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because the cry has come unto me. Now hold on a second. 
I want to meddle for a moment. They uh, were wanting a king. How many know the Bible says God will give you the desires of your heart? And he will. But that doesn't mean always your desires are good for you. Here they wanted a king. He tried to talk them out of it. They wouldn't have nothing else. He said, fine, I'll give you a king. He eventually got the right one in there. Not saying he didn't. He gave Saul an opportunity to do what's right. Prophetically ordained. But some people think just because God went and goes ahead and gives into something that that means that God is in all those things. We need to make sure that we are about our father's business, not trying to get our father to be about our business. That is the safest way to be. Y'all still here? Amen. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for he shall eat with me today. Tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thy heart. And as for thy asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And whom is all the desire of Israel? It is not on thee and all thy father's house. Of course, Samuel only knew what God revealed to him, because if Samuel knew everything that would make him omnipotent or all-knowing. Samuel had a word of knowledge for Saul. So, you know, so many times when people start dealing with people that, have, that operate heavily in a word of knowledge, they think, that person knows everything about me. They're like, read my mind, like some psychic's trying to say. But that is nothing what the Bible, the word of knowledge. They have a piece of the word of knowledge, a piece of knowledge right from God's mind, dropped right in the heart, only about that subject. And that's all they have. That's how a word of knowledge operates. Okay? And that's not the same as discerning of spirits, which is a whole other way that God does read your mail. And we can get to that later on. <laughs> he said to Saul, The asses which thou went thou went to seek are found, and lo, thy father had left the care of the asses, and saw you. Say, What shall I do for my son? For some of ten to. So he, he's Saul is Paul. Wow. <laughs> Samuel is telling Saul, hey, you came here looking for them. They're already found. Now your dad's worried about you. You've got to take care of some stuff. Mm -hmm. So he went to the prophet. He got some words of knowledge. Otherwise, he'd still been up in the mountains looking for the donkeys. The word of knowledge to Samuel regarding Saul. The word of knowledge also, also operated in the Old Testament to discover man in hiding. Although Samuel had already anointed Saul to be king over Israel, when it came time to reveal him as the king, Saul hid among the stuff. For Samuel 10, 22. I could relate to Saul. I didn't want to do it either. God came and found me too. More than once. When the people couldn't find him, they inquired of the Lord instead of sending everyone to look for him. Many times that is the quickest way to find an answer. How much quicker would it be if you went and asked God or went and asked the man of God instead of doing it the hard way. The people knew that the Lord knew where, where Saul was. The Lord told them exactly where Saul was. And they looked where, the, where God told them to look. They found Saul. That was a word of knowledge in operation. So word of knowledge. They didn't know where he was. They needed some knowledge about where he was at. They went, they went and asked the prophet. The prophet got a knowledge from, from, the, from the Lord. And he told them exactly where it was. Now, I've heard this story a million times. You know, it could be simple. Uh, I lost my keys. I called the man of God. He prayed, and the Lord told me right where my keys are at. That's like, happens all the time. You might say, well, that's trivial. It's still the beginning of a word of knowledge. When you have faith to believe for that, you'll start believing for more. Amen. And when I say he told you where you're at, I didn't say you had an inkling. I mean, he literally said, have you, did you check on the counter back there on your back dryer or sure? I believe there's something sitting there. And they tell you exactly, you go back, my keys. How do you know that? Well, because the Lord told me. What do you mean the Lord told you? Y'all still with me? Now, did I have any control? If that was me giving you that prophetic word, did I have any control over it? No. And just because you call and ask me doesn't mean I get to tell you where your keys is at every time either. But it should be a good place to get to start looking for some stuff. I'm going to get a bunch of phone calls. I can't buy my kids. 
Is this stuff real? Well, I'm just for you today. Lord have mercy. The word of knowledge manifested to locate a lost daughter. Before we discuss other Old Testament examples of the word of knowledge in operation, let me give you a modern day example of the God uses the word of knowledge to locate someone who is lost. That is scriptural. As we have seen an example of Samuel locating both Saul's donkeys and Saul himself and Saul was hiding. This is Brother Hayden teaching here. The daughter had been involved with a gang that when she was 16 years old. When she disappeared, the police thought the gang had killed her. 22 years had gone by. In the meantime, her mother and daddy and brother and sister had all gotten saved and filled the Holy Ghost. The family, with the exception of her mother, had all given up the girl for dead. The mother kept saying that something on the inside of her told her the girl was still alive. After I told the gift of the word of knowledge, a couple asked me, doesn't God know where our daughter is or whether she is not she's alive? Would it be all right for us to pray about it? I said, surely. And while they were praying about it one day in church, one of the women present had a vision. She saw a, saw a woman, now 38 years of age, in their garage apartment with two children, a boy and a girl. She saw the woman chained and held captive in that apartment. Then in the vision, she saw a letter come, and she saw the girl's father going to the post office to get the letter. Later, the woman told the couple about her vision and said that within 30 days, they would see her let them receive a letter saying their daughter was alive. At the end of 30 days, the father went to the post office, got a letter from his daughter who had been missing and presumed dead for 22 years. It's a true story. She was in Houston, Texas, the letter began. Dear Mom and Dad, I don't know whether you are alive or not, but if you you are and answer this, I will come and see you. I'm alive and well. I will explain everything to you when I see you. The daughter was reunited with her parents and her entire family. One Sunday morning, soon after that, the daughter came to our service together with her two children and her parents. That morning, she and her son were saved, and her daughter was saved later. The woman had told her parents, 22 years have come and gone since I was taken away. The law was cracking down the gang I was in, and because I was just 16, the gang was afraid I would squeal on them. This woman continued, one of the boys knew this, so he took me and ran away with me. We eventually got married, but I knew enough about him to send him to the electric chair, so he just kept me prisoner for a number of years. He would chain me before going to work every morning. I could get around the apartment, but I couldn't get out. For 22 years, these parents didn't know that God could really tell them about their daughter who was missing. They hadn't even thought to pray about it. But after hearing teaching along this line, they, along with others, were inspired to pray about it. And as they prayed, God gave them a word of knowledge, revealing that the woman was alive. God also gave them a word of wisdom, which we'll discuss in the next chapter, indicating that they would hear from her in a short time. And as pastor, I can think of thousands of words of knowledge through this church that God has done. But, you know, until you start putting demand on the gifts a lot of times, they, they don't work. The word of knowledge to Elijah. Then we see that the word of knowledge would manifest to enlighten and encourage and discourage servant. Elijah had a great time up on the mountaintop when he prayed the fire down from heaven. First Kings 1837 through 38. But when someone told him, Queen Elizabeth said about this time tomorrow, she's going to take your head off your shoulders. First Kings 19 2, Elijah became worried and fearful. Remember that anxiety? This guy, he just whipped all these prophets, prayed fire down from heaven, and now he's about to run off. Scared of some woman. He climbed under a Jupiter tree and begged God to let him die. Later he said to God, I have been very uh, later he said to God, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant, thrown down the altar, and slain by prophets with a sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take away. In other words, Elijah was saying, Everyone is backslidden but me, and everyone is bowed their knee to Baal, and I'm the only one left. <laughs> But God gave Elijah a word of knowledge and courage and life. And God said, no, you aren't the only one left. I have 7,000 people reserved to myself. And for the record, I'll teach this later on. God always has a remedy. Never believe the lies of the enemy, enemy that you're the only one left or you're the only one still serving God. Because all, God always has a remedy. Elijah couldn't have known that any other way. I'm sure it encouraged him to know that he wasn't the only one left. That God had 7,000 who hadn't bowed their knees to Baal. The word of knowledge to Elijah regarding Geh yeah, Gehazi. The word of knowledge was also used in the Old Testament to expose a hypocrite. 
How many know God can expose hypocrites? When Ahab was healed of leprosy and wanted to give the prophet Elisha changes of remnant and silver and gold, Elijah refused it. But his servant Gehazi ran after Nahum and lied to him. Think about that for a minute. The gumption it takes to serve a man of God that, that accurate, that powerful, and think that they can run ahead in line, take advantage of the giftings of God. But yet it happens every day, unfortunately. So Gazi followed after Nahum, and when Nahum saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chair to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well, my master has sent me, liar, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Nahum said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him, and bound two talents of silver and two bags and two chains of herbs, and laid them upon two of the servants, and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house, and he let the men go, and they departed. Nahum was so thrilled to be healed that he gave him twice the amount of money Gehazi asked for. And Gehazi hid it because he was a thief as well as a hypocrite and a liar. And when Elisha asked Gehazi where he had been, he said, Thy servant went nowhere. I didn't go nowhere, boss. I've been here all day. Elisha said, Went not my heart or spirit with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? And he, how could Elisha be sitting in his own house and yet know what was going on several miles away? God revealed it to him through a word of knowledge. God gave Elisha a supernatural revelation of what happened, and it exposed him as a hypocrite. And the Lord uses this with me all the time. I may have found it to be true. Were you sitting here next to me? No, but God was. The Holy Spirit was. I had no clue. He just told me to call. He just told me to talk to you. What's going on? I'll say this about the Holy Spirit, then I'll use it for myself. The Lord doesn't ask questions because he wants you to enlighten him. He usually asks questions because he's giving you a chance to come clean. Y'all see that? Yeah. The word of knowledge to Elisha regarding Syria. Also in the Old Testament, work, and they're not always conviction things, okay? We're just using that for illustration, moving on because that was the scriptures we were reading, all right? Word of knowledge is it doesn't always bring correction. Sometimes it brings encouragement, exhortation. We just read all that. But then what you all get the wrong commentation. Word of knowledge to Elisha regarding Syria. Alone in the Old Testament, word of knowledge is given to warn a king of the enemy's plans of destruction. How many of God is still showing us? He says he'll show his friends, he'll show them the plans of the enemy. Now, I have been around some spirit filled folks, and there was one time I was in a meeting, and uh, there were several other, they were supposedly spirit filled leaders there. Some of them are still around. They're really immature, to be honest, but. Uh, wasn't my place to say that. And God was spoke, speaking. They wanted to do some things together. And uh, the Lord showed us some plans to him. And I said, well, this is the Lord's plan. We need to pray and deal with this, this, and this. And boy, they got all kinds of offended and huffed up and said, that's stupid. We don't have to worry about this. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> well, nothing ever became of anything they wanted to talk about. As a matter of fact, uh, they, I, I've seen them, unfortunately, go through quite a bit. And they're starting to get a little matured by about now because because you show what the enemy's plans is, it doesn't mean you're confessing those. It means you're learning how God shows us those to pray and for those things to change and break. If you if you take offense and every time God's showing you the way to stop something, you're never gonna you're, you're never gonna overcome anything because the enemy's always got a plan. And but God's plans are always better. He always calls us. To, he said we always triumph through Christ Jesus. Amen. Yeah. So you know there's been different things. Uh, drawing a complete blank tonight. I, I can usually think of a million, but there was things since we've been here, there was some tax stuff and stuff on the building that people didn't do when they first had it, and I had to go through all kinds of stuff, and God told me it was going to be there. We, we, you know, but we were way ahead of it. Why? Because God made a, made a way and made it aware. I didn't go, you know, and if, I'd, if it just came up on me, it probably would have got a little anxiety over it, but I didn't. And we adapted and overcame. Amen. Y'all still with me? Then the king of Syria warred against Israel 
and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God said unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass, pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called the servants and said, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Who's telling this guy where we're going to be at? Listen, that's one thing that's great about the word of knowledge. It's like, who keeps telling these people my plans and they're always ready for it? <laughs> Think about it. That's what the God, God we serve. That's the Holy Spirit. It's the word of knowledge. He just keeps telling us his plans are ready every time. But see, if you let the enemy, you'll get the wrong thing. And people, I've seen people get in fear over a word of knowledge. Well, that's what's going to happen. We better prepare. Man, come on. You really think God showed you that to you prepare for the worst? Well, he said to prepare for the famine. That was a little different. And even then, he was showing you how to overcome it. Not get through it. Right? Amen. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, tell the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bed, James. Man, who told him? The Holy Spirit did. Every time an enemy would set up an ambush meant against Israel, the prophet of God would tell Israel their plans. Finally, this king got his servants together and said, We must have a traitor among us who is giving us away. The servants replied, No, it is not us. A prophet of God in Israel tells the king of Israel what you speak in your bedchamber. That was a supernatural revelation that God gave the prophet Elisha to warn him of the enemy's plans to harm Israel. And I can't tell you how many times I've told me, what are you doing? Did I do this? Okay. You know, and they're like, who told you? Nobody's the Holy Spirit said. The prophet, I couldn't have known otherwise. They had no clue. The prophet couldn't have known what the king had said in his bedchamber, what he was plotting, because he wasn't there. No, the plans were revealed to him supernaturally by the word of knowledge, and it saved Israel from danger. Amen? The word of knowledge in the New Testament. And, uh, We're going to save that for next week because there's a bunch of it. And I don't want to glass over it. I went really fast tonight. So we'll finish the word of knowledge next week. Start in the New Testament. And then the week after that, we'll be into the word of wisdom. Does anybody... I know I've been going fast, but if you'll... In my spirit, I can see where you guys are starting to get a better understanding of what a word of knowledge is. So it's not such a mystical term. Everybody getting that so far? Some of you are looking at me straight up. If not, no. All right. Deaconess, will you grab the microphone? It's 8 o'clock. Rebecca's already got her hand up. She's volunteering to go to the bathroom first. <laughs> um, the Holy Ghost decides which gifts we get. And um, we don't control the gifts. The gift controls us. Amen. Somebody else, something you got from tonight. Yeah. Eight, five. Well, where it says the word of knowledge to Elijah. Right before there, it says, uh, it says God also gave them a word of wisdom, indicating that they would hear from her in a short time. I mean, the question is, why is that a word of wisdom, not just a word of knowledge? I got to find where you're at. Right before the the heading, it says the word of knowledge to Elijah. It's on page five. Yeah, my pages are I broke up here for I've got yeah. the word of knowledge to Elijah Carpenter. There is that the one you're at? Or? Yeah, no, mine right before that. So why was that a word of wisdom and not a word of knowledge? I gotta find. I'm still not. Oh.
That's where the daughter was you know, reunited with her parents after 22 years. All right. Yeah, we're going to discuss that later in the next chapter. But that's a, he, he gave them a word of knowledge, and God also gave them a word of wisdom. And uh, the wisdom was that uh, how and when it was, the knowledge was this was going to happen, and a word of wisdom is how it was going to happen. But uh, we will cover that in chapter 13. Just a word of knowledge instead of wisdom. Well, one, one is, tell, is exhorting and telling something that can only come from God, and wisdom is something that can only heaven could have known. And it tells how it's going to take place. Which moves more into prophetic or revelation gifts instead of the factual gifts. I'm not explaining it well. I understand that. Because they knew where they were at, but not only did they know where they were at, they told her how she was going to come. Yes. Just not facts, but had revelation. Hopefully, I did that justice. Sister Heather. Just, just because God uses you in a gifting doesn't mean that's your exact gift. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, how I many of God does desire to use you? Please don't take nothing else away from that. But I know I talk deeply on some other stuff, but God desires to use it. He desires these gifts to be used in the body. But there's a right and a wrong way to do things. And we should be causing people to be hungry for the Spirit of God, not turned off from it. Somebody else tonight, you got something from the class? Or once? Sister Heather. The anointing is the gas um, that operates the gift. Yeah. Without it, Nothing happens. <laughs> Anybody else tonight? Brother Don. So in the Old Testament, they didn't have the Holy Spirit like we have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It didn't fill people. So there was a, I guess, more of a need for people to have a word of knowledge sometimes. If they didn't have the Holy Spirit to lead them. Right. Whereas today, we got the Holy Spirit, so there isn't really the need for a word of knowledge as much, right? I mean, it, because we have more revelation on our, kind of through our Holy Spirit living in us, right? We should have that a lot for ourselves, but I think that people are still doing things a lot harder than they have to because I believe God desires to share his secrets with his friends and there's people the more the word of God you put in you the more vocabulary you give the Holy Spirit right we can agree on that well there's people that have fine tuned that gift where you may get something and it may take you five years to figure out what God was saying to you in that revelatory gift when you could have went to the man of God he could just go dot 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 just because he can read the book clear because that's the gift in each flowing. That's my revelation. But you, but you are correct on all those things, and we should tap into those. But for me, the difference that I always look at, the difference between the Holy Spirit moving in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is they had them on them, and they had to wait for the anointing to rest on them, where we have him in us, and he's constantly there. And the more that we allow and give him room, the more he will operate in us all the time, is what you were trying to say also that night. I concur. Did that answer? Yeah. Amen. Good stuff. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Care that word care actually means anxiety. Sweet. Yeah. I uh, I used to be a very anxious person. That was well, the first verses I started standing in faith on. And fine. So if I cast them on, he would take them. 
Yeah, that's it. And then, you know, he gives us peace that passes all understanding, which means we, our brain can't figure out why we just feel calm and at peace. When normally we'd be, yeah, it's uh, just, I say simply, and I don't mean it because it wasn't simple, but uh, it is simply believing the word and relying on it to be fact, even when we don't feel it. And, yeah. yeah. So you, when you quote that word, you say, Lord, I see it in your word, I'm standing on faith. And the enemy may come in and try to bring even more anxiety for a minute. But the more you stand, the Bible says you resist the devil, he will flee. And then all of a sudden, peace starts to come rolling in. It's not what you feel, it's what you know. Right. So that is, a, and then the peace rolls in. So anybody else get something out? Well, the dogs had a good question. You make it work up here tonight. Um, Bless the Lord. Come back. In Jesus' name. It'll come back. It's good. Shouldn't have messed with it. This was a good night. Thank you. Amen. Anybody else got something tonight you're taking away? I believe that God wants you to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. Now, nobody commented too much, but how many have seen things done wrong and turned you off from the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit? Amen. Yeah. And, uh, and how many believe that you can see where the enemy's done that on purpose now because he's scared to death of the of the Holy Spirit moving the way God wants it to. And so he, he would rather get people, to, if he can't keep them from stopping to operate it, he wants to give, get, make it such, such a mess of it that nobody wants anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. And then, but that's for the fact, back up a moment, that doesn't, they're not operating in the Holy Spirit. They've tapped into something else. And, uh, but, uh, so we'll say, well, how would you, yes, ma'am. We have to remember, too, the Holy Ghost can give us more than one gifting. It doesn't have to be just one. And not only that, we have to remember, for example, the Holy Ghost may give Sister Becky a gift, and he may give me the same gift, but he's going to operate in a different way through us, through that same gift. Yeah, yeah. You can, you can empty out a Coke bottle, but when you fill up the Coke bottle, it still tastes like Coke. So when the Holy Spirit flows through you, it's still going to have your flavor. And it doesn't mean it's not always the more I'm, me, I'm very to the point, just not, not rude. I'm just, that's just me. That's how God made me. Somebody else, they, they may start off flowery because that's just how they talk. You won't find that with me. That doesn't mean either one, neither one, doesn't mean that neither one of them is from God. You know, it just means they flow differently. Thus says the Lord today, it will be by day, you know. No, sorry, Lord. Anybody else tonight? Did you get something? How many believe that God wants you to operate in words of knowledge? Amen. How many believe that God wants you to put a man on words of knowledge? Amen. Amen. You know, I, uh, now, I can say after I learned to put a demand on them, there were certain seasons in my life I would go to men of God in my life that I would, I'd be like, well, you know, I feel like God's about to change jobs. You got anything for me? No, thank God, nothing. Well, you ain't no help. Well, because there is coming. This is kind of, I think, maybe where Brother Don was going. There comes a time when God wants you to start learning to listen for yourself. But then after you, after you uh, fine tune that, I do believe he wants you to come back into the body then. And maybe you don't need such help on that, but there are certain things that the Lord wants to give you revelation on. And, or maybe say, uh, anybody ever, this is, I don't know who this is for, anybody ever had trouble on a job? Mm -hmm. And you just quite didn't know how to deal with something? And you could go to the man of God and give you some revelation, word of knowledge, how to deal with those things. Mm -hmm. uh, for one time, uh, I used to, well, when I left the mines, the Lord told me to go into full-time ministry. 
And I hate to tell you, but I wasn't completely obedient. Uh, and I, and it, wasn't, it wasn't the easiest time in my life. I, you know, not nobody can probably believe that, you know, right? No, completely obeying the word of God and all. And there's nothing wrong with working and ministering. The God, God calls you to do that. Paul made sense. But the Bible says the just shall live by faith. When you're called into the ministry, that's what God has called me into. And so I left the mines, to make a long story short, I went to work for a directional boring crew again. I thought it was a perfect job, man. It's supposed to be Monday through Friday. I can have all the weeknights off and weekends off. The old ministry, I can get some rest. In my mind, it was the perfect job. Well, then they started working me all kinds of hours, and they kept it, you know, they, they bumped me up. I was, became a, a foreman and a superintendent foreman, all this stuff. And, and, and then I was making it very hard to make church services. And I was like, well, Lord, why is this getting so hard? And you're like, where's the Lord of knowledge coming? Well, I started asking, and, uh, and uh, I wasn't getting much. So then we were in Rolla, Missouri, and we were drilling down. There's a whole new road there. You know, I probably know anything about direction boring, and that's okay. But we were drilling down, and we were about a quarter mile out. And the, uh, the the young man I had working for me at that time, uh, he was very motivated for himself. But when you do that, you have this device that you go over the ground and it reads the electronic in the head and tells you how deep you are, what angle you're at, where you're going. And anytime you cross over utilities, gas, water, fiber, you have to hand dig those up and verify them before you can go underneath them. Uh, that way, if something happens and they're located wrong, it's not on you. Well, I'd hand dug them up, verified it. I got this young man up there, and I can read it here. And I stopped four times. I had a check in my spirit four times, and I asked him to get me another reading. I said, well, can you see it? No, no, it's fine. All of a sudden, psh, I hit a gas main. Somewhere drilling in solid rock, okay? And, and I, it sparks flying out of and shut down the equipment. You know, people die doing this all the time. I mean, this is a big old 12 inch gas main. And uh, I call him, and everybody's talking about losing my job. And this young man's up there swearing he did all this and that. But uh, when I shut off the machine, the, the Holy Spirit had prompted me and told me to save it. And you have to save it. And I saved that last uh, reading that he sent me for proof. And then after calling my bosses and the, uh, and the uh, and uh, all the other ones, my next phone call was to my third phone call. I, I, I had to call the utility company and I had to call the owner of the company that I worked for, to the owner, owner. And then I called Pastor Billy. <laughs> <laughs> I said I made a mess. Pastor Billy worked full time. Go that house. I was like forty miles away from him. I just called and asked him to pray. Do you know who the first person on the scene was? Pastor Billy drove all the way over there and said, Brian, God told me to tell you this, this and this, and this is what you say and this is what you don't say. And he said, you, you saved this, didn't you? He read it all out. And then God turned I it into that. every <laughs> week. And then God turned it into an evangelistic opportunity. So here's my pastor, and there's a bunch of other guys I work with. And at work, we have to, when you have a gas fan, I hope this is for somebody tonight. When you have a gas main, you got to dig up on either side of it, and then you got to pinch it off so that you can fuse it back together. We're digging in solid rock, scraping, busting through, gas going everywhere still. And these guys are asking for me and Pastor Billy to pray because they're afraid they're going to blow it up at any time. And then I've been, they've been watching me all this time, and they're, at that time they called me preacher and said, Preacher, you... <laughs> You better really be doing something. We're all going to die here. <laughs> I said, no, we're not. <laughs> and, uh, of course, nothing happened. And got there. And all those guys are with the Lord. But, uh, you know, that word of knowledge that Pastor Billy obeyed and came and gave me peace in the midst of a very traumatic thing. And it wasn't a small thing. I mean, it made national news. Not the only time I've made it in my life. But, you know, <laughs> some of them were good. <laughs> but, uh I don't know who that's for, but that, you know, God cared about me. That wasn't, you know what I'm saying? It was something very, very personal to me. He, he didn't have to, but he did. And uh, he knew my heart, but I wasn't trying to skin him. So I hope that's for somebody. I, I've got, I've gave probably thousands of people here. You all can probably think of many more, but, uh, you know, to me, that always just ministered to me that, you know, he didn't have to do that. And the prophet 
Pastor Billy was uh, willing to drive all that way over to get me that word. He dropped everything he was doing. You know, so anyhow. Any other questions, thoughts, or comments? It's, we're we're going to get out here a decent time tonight. All right. Well, Deaconess, will you come take prayer requests and close us in prayer?